Hey guys, it's Greg with Apple Explained, and today we're going to explore the history of FaceTime. Because although Apple's video chatting service is simple and straightforward, it has quite a complicated and dramatic history that I've never really seen discussed in great detail. So that's exactly what we'll do in this video. Now this video topic came in third place in last week's voting poll, and if you didn't get to vote, make sure you're subscribed. That way, the polls will show up right in your mobile activity feed, and you can let me know which video you'd like to see next. Now, FaceTime has become a quintessential part of Apple's ecosystem. It seamlessly works between iOS and macOS, and for many people, it's hard to imagine living without. But FaceTime wasn't even around until the iPhone 4, which means the service is just eight years old and only recently adopted features that many users wanted years ago, like group video chats. But let's start from the beginning, before FaceTime was even revealed to the public, and follow its development to the present day. So when Apple decided they wanted to add video calling capabilities to the iPhone back in 2009, it was actually quite an ambitious idea, because although computers had been capable of video chatting for years, the feature was relatively new to mobile devices, and therefore very underdeveloped. In fact, one of the first cell phones capable of making video calls was the 2003 Sony Ericsson, which was in part made possible by faster 3G network speeds. But the experience was far from ideal. The front-facing camera was very low quality by today's standards at a resolution of just 176 by 144 and the 3G network's data speeds were still not fast enough, resulting in motion blur, lagging, and dropped video calls. But those were the early days of mobile video calling, and year after year, the technology was improved and refined until we saw a more modern implementation of the feature on HTC's Evo smartphone, which took advantage of Sprint's faster 4G network and its 4.3-inch display with a 1.3-megapixel front-facing camera. And I think this is when Apple saw the opportunity to offer a desktop class video calling service to millions of iPhone 4 users across the globe. So the company began to develop a mobile video calling application codenamed Venice that would have a leg up on its competition by offering unrivaled video and audio quality. But that led to Apple's first problem, because delivering high quality video and audio would require fast data speeds that 3G networks couldn't support. And considering the iPhone 4 and 4S would both be 3G phones, Apple had to make a tough decision. Either delay the release of their video calling service until they introduced a 4G phone, or restrict the service to Wi-Fi only. And as we all know, Apple decided to introduce FaceTime alongside the iPhone 4 and did in fact require a Wi-Fi connection. And although some journalists considered the service to be crippled by its inability to work over cellular, getting FaceTime out to iOS users sooner allowed Apple to be even better prepared to launch the service on macOS later that year and on cellular with the 4G-enabled iPhone 5. But before we get into that, it's worth mentioning that when Apple decided to name their video calling service FaceTime, they actually had to buy the name from an existing company called FaceTime Communications, who then changed their name to Act Giants. And we got an even closer look at how FaceTime was developed during the Apple Samsung patent trial, since Samsung asserted that FaceTime was based on their video calling technology and that Apple was infringing on their patents. But based on Apple's evidence, a large portion of FaceTime's technology was borrowed from Game Center, since both services shared features like networking for seamless user interaction, complex audio backend, and advanced video codec. So although Game Center wasn't wildly successful, it did provide the technological foundation that made FaceTime possible. And in June 2010, the public finally got to see FaceTime demoed by Steve Jobs and Jonathan Ive, and it set a high bar for other mobile video calling applications on the market. Now, there were many reasons why Apple was able to make FaceTime so much more advanced than its competition. Interestingly enough, one of FaceTime's major disadvantages was also one of its greatest advantages. You see, FaceTime was only available on Apple devices. The iPhone 4 was first, with support for the 4th Gen iPod Touch and Mac in the same year. But this actually made things a lot easier for Apple, because creating a video calling service that only runs on their own hardware is a lot easier than trying to create a service that supports dozens of operating systems and hundreds of different devices. Also, Apple was able to leverage video encode and decode technology that wasn't available for third-party applications like Skype. And basically what this meant for users was that FaceTime wouldn't drain their battery as quickly or slow down their device's performance. Now, when users were able to try out FaceTime for themselves, most found it to be incredible. A Mashable review written by Christina Warren said, I've had several subsequent chats throughout the afternoon, and I have to say, each time it seems less and less like a novelty and more and more like a really natural way to communicate. 
She went on to praise FaceTime for being extremely simple and straightforward to use, which is a major improvement from other video calling services that require the user to manage specific settings to ensure a smooth experience. And while the front-facing camera didn't provide the most high-definition video, there was hardly any lag and the audio was always in sync. Which brings me to the most impressive feature of FaceTime, the audio quality. Many users remarked that they felt like they were in the same room with the person they were FaceTiming thanks to the audio that came through loud and clear. So I think the release of FaceTime marked an important moment in video calling history, since it helped make mobile video calls accessible to even non-tech savvy users and made them feel more natural than ever before. But despite FaceTime's great performance, video quality, and sound quality, Apple failed to deliver on the promise that FaceTime would be open source and cross-platform by utilizing something called peer-to-peer -peer connection. And that means we should have been able to dial a phone number and initiate a phone call just as easily as making a traditional voice call. And Apple supposedly had this technology ready to go until a patent troll named Vernet X brought a lawsuit against Apple, claiming FaceTime infringed on their patents. Vernet X ended up winning the lawsuit, and Apple was not only ordered to pay $368.2 million in damages, but FaceTime had to be completely re-engineered to use a central server managed by Apple instead of utilizing peer-to-peer -peer connections in which each device acted as a server for the other. This meant maintaining FaceTime's operations would become much more expensive for Apple and prevented any chance of the service becoming open source or cross-platform since hosting extra connections to FaceTime's server from Android devices or PCs would have cost Apple way too much money, especially considering the service doesn't directly generate any revenue for Apple to begin with. This patent lawsuit is also the reason why it took Apple so long to implement group FaceTime calls, which was a feature they intended on introducing much sooner. Now that may seem like enough legal trouble for one application, but Apple ran into another problem in 2011 when FaceTime left beta and was ready to be delivered to Mac users through a software update. Apple intended on providing the FaceTime app for free, but there's an obscure accounting law called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which prevents companies from providing a free, unadvertised feature to a product that has already been sold. So in order for Apple to deliver FaceTime to Mac users, they were required to charge for it. As a result, FaceTime was made available on the Mac App Store as a $1 download. This law is also the reason why Apple charged $2 for a software update back in 2007 that enabled 802.11n technology on select Macs. But Apple has since circumvented this law by including FaceTime as an advertised feature on their new products. Now in 2011, Apple finally allowed FaceTime calls over cellular. But it wasn't that simple for users because carriers were very tricky about how they allowed access to this feature. For example, AT&T only offered FaceTime over cellular for customers on their mobile shared data plan. So if you were already on an unlimited data plan and switched to the mobile share plan to access FaceTime over cellular, you'd lose the perk of having unlimited data. So therefore, you could only use FaceTime if you had limited data. And video calling just so happened to be a data hog. So AT&T effectively discouraged the use of FaceTime over cellular by only offering it to customers who'd rather not waste their limited data on video calls. And if this sounds a bit anti-competitive to you, the FCC would agree, because they eventually fined AT&T for violating net neutrality laws that prevents companies from blocking apps that compete with their own voice and video services. So shortly after, AT&T's FaceTime restrictions were lifted. And I should mention that both Verizon and Sprint allowed for FaceTime over cellular without any restrictions from day one. So since all the drama surrounding FaceTime's initial release had settled down for a few years, it was about time for another round of controversy by 2019, because that's when Apple released group FaceTime, and with it, a serious bug. A teenager discovered that when you made a call, you could hear audio from the recipient's microphone even if they didn't pick up. Apple made a statement saying they'd release a fix later in the week, but that's when things got even worse. Because then 9to5Mac discovered that if someone calls you when you push the power button to dismiss the call, FaceTime will begin sending an audio and video feed to the caller without you even being aware of it. So right when the first round of negative press surrounding FaceTime began to taper off, this second bug was found and landed Apple in even hotter water. And you can imagine how frustrating this was for Apple, since they've repeatedly argued that they're the most trustworthy tech company when it comes to protecting their users' right to privacy, but it is important to remember that this was a bug and has since been fixed, so Apple definitely handled this situation appropriately. I just hope they can implement a more effective quality control protocol to squash these kinds of bugs before reaching the public. Now today, FaceTime is at an incredible place, 
with support for up to 32 people in a group call, the ability to chat as your Memoji, and even take live photos of something special happening during a call. It's incredible to reflect on how far FaceTime has come since 2010, despite some hangups along the way, and I'm looking forward to see where Apple takes it in the future. Now, as you can imagine, I usually have to stay up late at night to finish YouTube videos, but I don't enjoy the taste of energy drinks or coffee. So instead, I eat caffeinated chocolate. And my favorite brand, Awake, was kind enough to sponsor this video. They offer delicious bite-sized chocolates that contain 50 milligrams of caffeine, the equivalent of half a cup of coffee. And you can choose from four flavors, milk and dark chocolate, caramel, and peanut butter. They're gluten-free, don't have any artificial colors or flavors, and are much more convenient than brewing a cup of coffee. Now, if you want to try these for yourself, just click the link in the description, and don't forget to use the discount code Apple Explained for 25% off your order. All right, guys, so that is the history of FaceTime. And if you want to vote for the next video topic, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.